Welcome to Let's Talk Micro. Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Micro. I hope you had a good week. So like always, Let's Talk Micro is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Overcast, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, Pandora. Basically, wherever you listen to your podcast, you can find Let's Talk Micro. I am also on Instagram as Let's Talk Micro No Apostrophe and on Twitter as Let's Talk Micro One. So go ahead and follow. I like to post pictures of organisms and stuff like that. So on today's episode, I will continue going over anaerobes. So on the last episode, I went over, I talked about that anaerobes, you know, this group of organisms that I'm talking about, they cannot grow in the presence of oxygen, right? They lack some enzymes, so oxygen is harmful to them. So we have to keep in mind that when we are plating um, our cultures, we have to make sure that in order to successfully recover these organisms, since they cannot grow in the presence of oxygen, we have to select the proper source and the right media and proper incubating conditions, right? So I talked about how the American Society for Microbiology says that the collection of specimens and swabs should be discovered, discouraged for anaerobic recovery because swabs have a small surface area and are prone to pick normal flora. And this can give an inaccurate result of what the pathogen should be. Unacceptable sources include throat swabs, urine, and superficial areas, right? If, if anaerobes, they don't like growing in the presence of oxygen, well, they don't like it, it's just they can't. Then you're not going to recover them from a superficial area. So you should do anaerobic cultures on specimens like, our, like deep aspirates, wounds, or specimens that are surgically collected. And then I mentioned that so you need to incubate these organisms properly. So there are some systems, systems out there that they you know, provide carbon dioxide and they eliminate the oxygen. Keep in mind that we, I went over three systems. However, you know, these are not the only three systems out there. These are systems that I have worked with and I compare and contrasted them. Um, the selection of these systems is based on, you know, your lab can select them based on the size, on the volume, for example, the Mitsubishi and the Easy. Those are typically, large facilities have them too, but typically smaller labs, they like to keep them. Maybe their volume is low. So just having some, some jars, some bags with some sachets, you know, that's enough. You don't have that much volume. Um, whereas a large facility can definitely benefit from using the anoxomat. You have high volume, so it needs a tank. The, ta the tank needs to be replaced. So they can justify the cost. A lot of these instruments and these test methods, um, you have to justify the cost, right? Because it's, a, it's an expense. So if your facility doesn't have a large volume, you cannot really justify it. So, but however, the bags... And the jars, you can have them in large labs because sometimes, you know, maybe the volume slows down. You already use your jars for, you know, you have an X amount of jars. Maybe the volume went up and you use them all. And so you need the bags to complement so you can continue setting up anaerobes. And then on the bench, depending on what your volume is, maybe you're trying to rule out an anaerobe. So the bags are more convenient rather than having to sew out a plate, put it in a jar, connect it to the tank, and use the anoxomat. It is just simpler to sub it, put it in the bag, add the sachet, your indicator, and then you're done. The BD gas pack and the Mitsubishi gas chemical systems, you know, you have some indicators that you put in there. So there are like some tablets in plastic that you know they change colors if, ox if they are exposed to oxygen so this is re definitely really good because that way it makes sure that you, maybe you didn't close your jar properly you didn't close your bag properly so in the case of the bd aspect system it changes from white to blue 
and on the Mitsubishi gas chemical approach and an anaerob pouch, it changes from purple to pink. And then one of the main differences between these systems is other than you know one is bags and jars, and then the other one is the jars with the tanks. It's the time it takes to achieve an anaerobic environment. So for the easy system, it takes two and a half hours, two hours for the Mitsubishi, and 10 minutes for the Anoxomat. So the Anoxomat is definitely very convenient because you know you put those organisms, those plates there, and once you connect them to the tank, and you're done, in 10 minutes you have an anaerobic environment. I did talk on the previous episode about how sometimes you know you're busy, you start setting up your plates, they don't get to the bags or jars maybe an hour afterwards, hour and a half. And then if you use these back systems, then it can be a total of three hours before they are, before an anaerobic environment is achieved. So that can definitely affect the, you know, the chances of, of you recovering an anaerobe. So, and then yes, with the anoxomat, there are more checks in place. There is a tank involved, but once you put it there, it's 10 minutes. And then from my experience, the organisms, since you get that anaerobic environment faster, you get a stronger growth faster too. Whereas you might have to wait for the full day for your organisms in the back to grow. And then at the full day mark on the anoxomat, you have a pretty robust growth. So that's also really good. So I mentioned that in order to recover anaerobes so you need proper incubation you need the proper source and you need proper media so now that you know the proper incubation time you know what sources to choose then we ask ourselves what media do we use well like i mentioned using a blood agar plate incubated anaerobically will not be very helpful because most organisms are facultative anaerobes so there will be many organisms growing on it. And I talked about how, you know, stav, enterobacteriales, streps, enterococcus, they grow anaerobically and quite strongly. So if that's your medium of choice, then you're going to have a lot of growth. So maybe on some sources where you don't have that much bacteria growing, it might be a little it might be easy for you to recover that anaerobe but if you have a source where there's like a lot of bacteria you have a lot of growth then you're going to have a hard time trying to rule out that anaerobe and to be honest you might even miss it so we need to use and before i go that uh, before i talk about that yes i mean sometimes there are some instances where especially with the pandemic that your media is in back order and you have to result to maybe using a blood plate but then you're gonna have but you're gonna have a harder time i mean you cannot help if your media it's in back order and you have to make do with other agar that you have in the lab but if you just use a blood plate you might miss some organisms so we need to use selective media with the appropriate nutrients for anaerobes to grow so when i talked about thio i talked about hemin and vitamin k these are required for most anaerobes to grow. So when you look at some of this media, you're going to see that some of it has human and vitamin K because it is required for most anaerobes to grow. So let's go over the process, right? So you see growth on an agar plate. What do you do? Is it an anaerobe or a facultative anaerobe? Well, first do a gram stain and then perform an error tolerance test. And I have talked about this. This might also be called an anaerobe challenge test. You subculture an organism to agar and then incubate a plate aerobically and one anaerobically. And I have seen this done with different agar. Some places might do a blood agar, incubating one aerobically and one anaerobically. However, the American Society for Microbiology, the ASM, says to incubate a chocolate aerobically and a blood plate anaerobically. And why is this? Well, it is to make sure that you don't miss fastidious organisms, such as Haemophilus. As you know, Haemophilus does not grow on blood agar. 
And if some of you are thinking, yes, it can. Yes, but we'll talk that more about that when I go over Haemophilus. There are some specific conditions due to some growth requirements that Haemophilus has that might allow Haemophilus to grow on blood order. But we'll talk more about that down the line. So this challenge portion that I'm talking about is when you actually, you already have some media that has incubated and you're seeing growth, you're doing your gram stain and then you're doing a challenge to make sure that if it's a, a, a facultative anaerobe versus an actual anaerobe. Um, but however, as I talk about this media for anaerobes, this is, it's when you actually get the culture from the processing side, you're setting up you know, a combination of this agar that I'm talking about. That way, so when you get to the bench and then you have some growth, then you can do your challenge. So we're just backing now. And this agar that I'm talking about is when you are processing your culture, right? So you're doing your blood, your chocolate, your McConkie for your aerobic, you know, your PEA. And then you're setting up a combination of this anaerobic media. So uh, there's a CDC anaerobic with 5% sheep blood arc. This is a general enriched media. It supports the growth of anaerobes, but it also supports the growth of facultative anaerobes. The staff, strep, and enterobacterialis will grow on it. So once again, this is like, a, like an anaerobic blood agar so it will help you know help out anaerobic organisms but at the same time it will grow your facultative anaerobes so if you're just using this plate you need to correlate it with what you're seeing aerobically you know you see staff on your anaerobic plate on your cdc check your blood plate see if that one is growing aerobically so by itself it might not be as useful in cases where you have a lot of growth. So you're definitely your your error tolerance of your or your Anna challenge definitely comes in handy with this agar. If you have a lot of growth, if you're not sure if you have anaerobes or not, because you see a lot of growth aerobically and you see a lot of growth anaerobically. So you you will do your challenge. So what's in CDC agar? So you're wondering what, what, does, what does the CDC stand for? Uh, well, this agar was um, formulated by the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. So it has tryptocase soy agar supplemented with uh, additional agar. It has yeast extract. It has vitamin K1, hemin, cysteine, and 5% sheep blood. So it is improved for the growth of Probotella, Fusobacterium, Clostridium hemolyticum, and some uh, strains of Actinomyces israeli. So then what other agar do we have? So we have shalers. It has casein, soybean, yeast extract, hemin, vitamin K. You know, the peptones provide nitrogenous growth factors, carbon, sulfur, and trace ingredients. The yeast extract provides B vitamins. Vitamin K enhances the growth of bacteroides and is needed for some strains of Prevotella. There is also a version of Shaler agar that has canamycin and vancomycin. So this helps select for, helps select for anaerobic gram-negative rods. You, know, you always need to do a gram stain and error tolerance test. You could have a, a yeast or a bacteria that's resistant to vancomycin. So definitely, I mean, if you have the Molotov, it's definitely easier because you can put that colony on the Molotov and get an ID and you're done. But if you don't have a Molotov and you have like a Vitek, then you need to do your challenge, your gram stain and your challenge. And then the next day when you have enough growth, which I mentioned this in the previous episode, like an anaerobic um, ID card on the Vitek, you need a 3, 3.0 McFarland suspension. That's very heavy. So you need a full, pr full plate of growth. So that if, you, you know, if, if your colonies are mixed with something else and you have to sub it, 
it will take a day or so, depending on the system that you have, to get that you know that healthy level of growth for you to perform that ID. So as we compare CDC and Shadlers, so typically, like I mentioned, a lot of a lot of organisms can grow on CDC, but then not as many can grow on Shadlers. So that definitely helps you with your gram-negative rods because you can have the CDC full of enterobacteriales and you can have a lot of growth in there. So you are like, is it an anaerobe, is it not? And then maybe if you're not as experienced, you are doing error tolerance tests on three or four colonies. And the next day you find out that they were all enterobacteriales. Cause some of these sources they can get, you know, they are very heavy with bacteria. So setting up a CDC by itself is not helpful. But when you set it and then you set up shalers, then you can see like a lot of growth on the CDC and then not as much growth on the shalers. And you can see the colonies that you're looking for, like your bacteroides, your prevotalum. But like always, if you don't have a Molotov, you know, do your error tolerance test the next day. If it's an anaerobe, you have that nice isolated plate for you to set up your ID. You know, you can also use PEA with 5% sheep blood hawker. It has phenyl ethyl alcohol, which inhibits the growth of gram negative bacteria. And as you know, microbiologists, you know that PEA, when you use it, you know, you like to use it when you have like your abscess cultures to give those gram positive organisms a chance because, you know, you can get that produce swarming. You can get those enterobacteriales growing heavy in there. And then that enterococcus or that strep or that staph aureus might not have a chance. But as some of you know, like especially when you incubate a PEA aerobically, you can get gram negative runs growing in there. And in fact, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, it likes to grow on PEA. So on some heavy cultures where you have many organisms, and then you still, you know, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is an organism that you need to rule out. So if you have it, you need to work it up as in providing ID on susceptibilities. So from the PEA, you, when you have these mixed cultures, you actually get a chance to isolate it. And I have done this before where I have a, I know I have a pseudo in there, but it might be mixed with some produce or something else. So I grab the colonies, put them on a PEA, and then the next day I sub them to a blood plate or a McConkie plate. And you get that beautiful isolation. So PEA inhibits produce from swarming and then uh, facultative anaerobes can grow so an error tolerance test is needed. And also a PEA of course aids in the recovery of anaerobic gram positive rods like your clostridium. Then moving on with the agar we have BBE agar. This is bacteroides bile esculine agar. It is for the isolation of the bacteroides fragilis group. The agar, in addition to the previously mentioned ingredients, has gentamicin and oxgal to inhibit other anaerobes and facultative anaerobes. It has bile esculine, which is hydrolyzed by members of the B fragilis group, forming a dark brown to black color. And there are also biplates that have this BBE agar, bacteroides bile esculine agar. And on the other half, they have CDC lake blood agar, with lake that's sliced, with canamycin and vancomycin. The lake red blood cells improve pigmentation of Prevotella melaninogenica. So when you are in the lab, you can see depending on where you are, you have a combination of this media. From the processing point, when you set up your cultures, some places, like I have worked in places where you do like a CDC and a Shadler's, and that's it. That's like the standard, the standard set of plates for the culture. And then you incubate it, you know, like for about five days in some places. Other places they do 48 hours. The one in five days, you check it at intervals. 
And then, so some other places, you know, like I said, this one uses CDC and shaders. Some other places can use like a, like a PEA, a BBE, you know, biplate with CDC, you know, with like leg red blood cells with canamycin and vancomycin and a CDC plate. So it can vary from the, depending on where you work at. But I will say that definitely having that PEA helps out. So you can help out those anaerobic gram-positive rods. But you definitely need um, something, especially you know, having something that helps identify bacteroides faster and prevotella is definitely convenient because those are the most common gram-negative rods that you get in the lab. You know, bacteroides is very common. It's like getting E. coli on the aerobic side. A lot of most times that you have an anaerobic bacteroides. So having some agar that can help, you know, recover it and make it easier to identify is definitely very helpful. But you need, definitely need, you know, like a PEA and a medium that can select for those gram-negative rods. And of course, having your CDC is very helpful. Um, not all gram-negative rods can grow in shalers. The anaerobic gram-negative rods so you need a combination of these plates. So it can vary from facility to facility, but based on what I said and the ingredients, you, know, you should definitely have two or three plates and that will help maximize the recovery of anaerobes. So as far as the error tolerance, like I mentioned, some places can do a blood auger, but based on the recommendations of the ASM, American Society for Microbiology, which has no relationship with this podcast, um, you should do a chocolate aerobically. Remember, you know, we're trying to do the best we can, make sure we don't miss any bacteria. So by having a chocolate plate aerobically, you can give those fastidious organisms a better chance at recovery and you make sure you don't miss anything. And that, my dear audience, is the end of this episode. I hope you enjoy listening about anaerobic agar because I certainly enjoy talking about it. Continue staying motivated. Continue staying passionate. Please, you know, bring that passion into everything you do. Being a microbiologist is such a rewarding job. You know, there's nothing like waking up and going to a mound of plates to see how we can help patients. It's an amazing job and we can definitely use all the help we can. So with this podcast, I want to, you know, make sure that there's more awareness about this profession so we can get more people in and, and do this amazing job. I will let everyone know about the Pastorella episode when I get it ready. In the meantime, continue staying motivated, stay safe. And of course, continue talking micro. Until the next time, bye.